on this computer. All right. All right. I'm I'm currently recording. Super. Um, so who and am I? So <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> on that note, yes. let me introduce you. All right. Um, so our guest today is Chris Lyons, who is the head librarian of rare books and special collections at McGill University. Um, he joined the McGill Library in 2004 as a liaison librarian at the Osler Library in the History of Medicine, where he was subsequently appointed head librarian. Chris has presented and published in the fields of rare books, librarianship, and library history. And Chris is also a, a good friend of the Argo Bookstore, and we are very, very happy to have him here. Um, so, thank you so much. without further ado, the, uh, the mic is yours. Great. Well, thank you, Adele, and thank you, uh, Modi, and thank you all for taking the time to, uh, um, you know, blow an hour out of your lives. I think if nothing else, it's indicative of how desperate we are for entertainment since the being quarantined, but I'm grateful for that. And uh, I'm assuming that many of you like me are bibliophiles. Now, normally if I was talking to a room full of people I could see, I'd ask for people like a show of hands to see who's a bibliophile and everything like that. Uh, in part because of the talk, but also in part of because who am I doing it for? Uh, yes. I'm going to interrupt. There actually is yeah. a hand raising and or emote giving oh, mechanism good. Oh, in, uh, yes. in, in Zoom that I forgot to mention. So if, uh, if people do want to do some sort of show of hands, it is true that probably everyone here likes books. It'd be very yeah. strange for you to be doing a uh, coming to an event about rare books hosted by a bookstore if you're not at least a little bit into them. Yeah. Um, but yes, there is a way for you to, to wave. Now, um, when I started at McGill in 2004 as a librarian, I had no idea why I thought, having been a history teacher before that, I'd have the chance to actually not only be a librarian, but to be a rare books librarian, when I assume there are more brain surgeons in Canada than there are rare book librarians, but I had the great good fortune to get a job at McGill, and I've been there for 15 years, and um, as I often say, I feel like a drunk getting a job as a taste tester in a distillery because I'm not only surrounded by wonderful books and people who love them, um, I'm actually paid not only to be there but even given money to buy more books. And if that doesn't sound like heaven, I don't know what does. And it's particularly, I think, moving for me to give this talk here because I don't know if you know the story of Argo. It's a wonderful bookstore. It's, as they say, in their on their website and elsewhere it's the oldest independent english language bookstore in montreal it started in 1966 and it started by this man here mr john george although no one ever called him by his first name um it was always mr george because he had that air about him he was a wonderfully dickensian man uh he would he he was a librarian as well actually who went into books in book selling in 1966 because he was excited at the idea of providing good literature to people. I'm not going to compete with the cat. I'm just going to sit back and let everyone enjoy the cat. But um, She was trying to crawl into the keyboard, so oh, I didn't know if that yes. would mess up the recording or the, the I, event, so I tried to just... I know, I know the feeling. Um, we have two very plump ones who like to do that too. I think it's the warmth of the computers. Anyway, so Mr. George opened up a bookstore so that he could provide affordable fiction and good literature for people as a vocation. And the last time I saw him was shortly before he died, my daughter and I, uh, who was maybe about 12 at the, no, 2006, she was seven at the time, visited him in the Montreal General Hospital. And he was sitting up in bed, reading the Times Literary Supplement, choosing books for the store. Um, and he, told me that uh, earlier that day, one of the residents uh, had come in to check on him and speak to him. And Mr. George had asked him, have you ever read Dickens? And the uh, resident who was younger and, and a, bit, a bit taken aback, I would suspect, said, uh, no, I, you know, I haven't had the chance, I'm busy. And Mr. George shot back, how can you understand your patience if you've never read Dickens? Go to my store and buy some. And I didn't think he said that so he could drum up a few sales. I think that was really how he felt about uh, the importance of books in society and reading in society. And I'm happy to say that um, 
Adele and Moti have continued this wonderful, uh, you know, vocation of providing a space, as you said, a communal space, a communal space for people to get together, not only to buy books, but to talk about books and to appreciate them. And it's just wonderful to see uh, Argo being um, so well curated by the two of you. And I've used as an excuse, I'll be quite frank with you, more than anything else, the, the idea of supporting an independent bookstore, and yours in particular, to just go crazy buying all kinds of books. And it's true, they'll order books from anywhere. Um, they'll ship them to your house, or they'll do this wonderfully, uh, almost deviant feeling exchange between noon and three from Monday to Friday, where you can go and they'll sort of slip you the books and then you, you slip them money, almost like a drug deal, actually, but the best kind of drug deal. Um, so having said that, and having said how wonderful Argo is, I'll switch to uh, my particular area of, um, of uh, you know, my bibliographical universe, which is McGill University, in particular rare books and special collections. But I want to speak about McGill's collections broadly, not just what's in rare books and special collections. And I have one very specific reason for doing so, and that is because I want everyone who's watching this to know that we're open and available for each and every one of you and everyone else who might see this to come and enjoy our collections. We're a public institution, but more than that, we're a publicly spirited um, institution. And often it's very interesting, but people feel quite intimidated by rare books libraries. Um, and this is not necessarily uh, coincidental. I think traditionally rare books libraries have had a very exclusive air, almost like Fort Knox or something, where you, you, people weren't comfortable coming just out of curiosity or anything like that. They felt they had to have a really serious special reason. Even undergraduates express this, and it's surprising to me because it's, we don't cultivate it quite the opposite, but it's almost like it's genetic, that they're intimidated. But the good news is not at all. And McGill uh, rare collections or, or several elements of the rare collections, there are more, uh, or special collections, are now uh, joined together under the acronym of ROAR, as you can see, made up of rare books and special collections, which is you know, 400,000 monographs, but also wonderful archival collections, uh, architectural collections, and um, Osler Library, the History of Medicine, one of the premier medical history libraries in the world. Uh, the Visual Arts Collection, curated by my friend Wendy Owens. And the McGill University Archives, which has wonderful collections of historical material, not only uh, related to McGill University, but of um, Montreal history and other things. There are other collections in the Music Library and in the Law Library as well. And it's just this incredible, vast richness in our city. And because we're a public institution, as I was saying, they're accessible to everyone. So that's the good news. If you don't remember anything else, uh, I want you to remember two things. One, Argo, and two, uh, Rare Books and the McGill University Library. We have very exciting things going on, in including a upcoming, well, current uh, building uh, drive, something called Fiat Lux. And the idea is that we'll redevelop the library and our rare collections will be front and center. So that's very exciting. We've gotten some good, generous donations so far, and we'll keep going with that. And sooner or later, you'll see us in this wonderful new space. So I want to tell you a bit about the evolution of the rare books and special collections writ large at McGill to give you a feel for its evolution to what's there now, because, you know, being his, uh, historically trained, um, I'm historically minded. So I like to go back and say, well, how did we get to where we are today? And McGill being 200 years old is, I think, significant and it will be next year, it's bicentennial, but not only for its age, but also because of what we've managed to amass over time. And part of the collection is deliberately collecting historical material, but a lot of it just is material we collected as we went along. And because we've been around for so long and we had the good sense to 
um, curate it and preserve it, we have this tremendous collection of all that documents the evolution over the past 200 years and before. Um, you know, unequaled, really, in Canada at least. And as I keep saying, the exciting thing is it's accessible to us. So Miguel's library started out as, you know, a 19th century smallish university, nothing too fancy, but we developed and we did get some interesting collection. And the other stream of this talk is um, the wonderful donations we've received and the donors and the builders who have gone into developing the library. So one of our first major interesting acquisitions was this. So if you're familiar with the name, if nothing else, this is a beautiful publication done over 11 years, as you can see, in what's called elephant folio. So folio is just a particular size, large book. So double folios and then elephant folios are these wonderful life-size plates that were made to show the natural ornithological history of the United States. So this was put together, it was hugely expensive. There were not a tremendous number of these made. It was a large undertaking and we were very lucky as you can see the beautiful hand colored uh, plates of the book that in the 1860s i don't know if you can read the names on this there was a donation um, of a thousand dollars various montrealers and you can see some of the names and you'd recognize them of streets if nothing else of prominent montrealers banding together to acquire one of these books which already you know, this is 160 years ago, was recognized as a substantial publication. The money was raised, and it's interesting. Um, these occasionally go on sale today. There are about 400 plates to them. Uh, and so we got for $1,000, which was a tremendous amount of money at the time, but is a bargain today because that, if we were trying to acquire this, um, we'd probably have to spend upwards of $10 million US, which is about eight gajillion dollars Canadian at this point. And so we were extremely lucky to have had the kind uh, of donors that we had to help us build up our collection. Now, things take yet another turn for the better uh, in the late 1890s or early 1890s when Peter Redpath and his wife, uh, Amy Redpath, um, or it's Grace, I'm not quite sure, con started to contribute to building the library. One of the things which you'll recognize, even if you don't know the name behind it, is the Redpath Library, which was the first purpose-built library building at McGill. And it's beautiful. And if you look at this reading room, I am so jealous that um, I never got a chance to study there. It's now Redpath Hall, and they're beautiful. it's a beautiful concert space. And but previous to that, it was a stunning reading room, as you can see there. The collection really took off in a major way under this man. He was the um, head of the library from 1920 to 1947. McGill had taken a profound shift in the early 20th century from you know a training school, classical college, uh, to a real in research intensive university and started to give uh, doctoral degrees in the sciences and other areas and so required a different kind of collection. So the shift was from a general, if you think like an undergraduate collection, to one that really required deep uh, uh, collections in contemporary thought but then also historical thought as well. So Dr. Lomer really started to work very hard at building the, the collections and the depth of the collections. And he got some pretty substantial assistance. So people like F. Cleveland Morgan. Now, for Montrealers of a certain age, the Morgan name might ring a bell because the Bay Department Store used to be Morgan's and the Morgan family. And F. Cleveland Morgan was a person of means who was interested in the arts and in part was uh, one of the major, I think, uh, engines behind the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts and uh, various other things, but including developing the collection, the historical collection at McGill. 
So with his help, we acquired a number of things, including uh, the nucleus of our very now much richer collection of medieval manuscripts. As you can see, these beautifully illustrated uh, works uh, religion used for various religious purposes. Oh, I love this one. This illustration, Lady Roddick, um, was the, the Red Path's daughter who married Thomas Roddick, and uh, whom the Roddick Gates are named after. As you can see, it's the murder of Charles Beckett, Charles of Beckett, St. Thomas of Beckett, sorry. Uh, there he is being done away with, and other beautiful illustrated manuscripts as well in our collection. If those of you, those of you who went to the exhibition at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts about a year ago or so on books of ours would have seen a number of uh, books from our collection. There's a catalog uh, resume from that as well that's available. And this was collected in the early 20th century, a number of Sumerian and related uh, tablets. As you can see, this is the oldest uh, piece in our collection. Uh, when people ask me, what's the oldest book in your collection? I sort of get a bit smart assed and I say, well, it depends on what you mean by a book. And I say, if it's something with, uh, in, you know, inscribed symbols on it that can be decoded and turned into words, it would be these. Uh, these, a number of them were purchased during the First World War by someone who knew someone at McGill who was stationed in the Middle East at the time. So that's how they came to us. Most of them are very um, sort of pedestrian sorts of records. They're um, lists of uh, either property or something, a bill of sale or that sort of thing. But some of them are a bit more interesting. I'll get to one of those in a sec. Um, there you can see it again. Another major collection to come under the era of Gerhard Lohmert is the Osler Library of the History of Medicine which was the creation of this man, Sir William Osler, 1849-1919. I'm embarrassed to say that despite being a fifth generation Canadian who studied Canadian history, I had no idea who Sir William Osler was until probably the day before my interview at the Osler Library. And of course, at my interview, I professed a, a lifelong you know, admiration for the man and uh, you know, lifetime devoted to the study of him. Anyway. He was, and in some respects still is, perhaps one of the most famous and revered people in Anglo-American medicine, uh, was born in Ontario, was a graduate of the McGill Medical School, subsequently taught here before going on to co-founding Johns Hopkins Medical School and Hospital, and then ending up as Regis Professor of Medicine at Oxford and was knighted in 1911 was a man not only known for his breadth of his knowledge in medicine, but his inspirational role in medicine and explaining uh, how medicine is a way of serving humanity. So he's still very much um, uh, revered and is influential in this way to people. Uh, was a sort of early proponent of whole person care, of treating people as individuals with feelings and thoughts and not just you know, pathologies on legs. Um, but part of his belief was that it was important for people in medicine to know their history, in part because it gives them a better understanding of the evolution of medical thought. So they're not just stuck in, well, what I know now is true, but they understand the evolution of the thought of medicine, but also as a way of connecting with uh, the giants in medicine, the people of the past who would act as an inspiration you know, reading their works is almost a spiritual communion with these people. So for him, books were important, historical books were important, and be, having access to them, being aware of these people was very important. So he put together a collection of about 8,000 volumes, which he gave to McGill. He died in uh, 1919, as you can see, and they were donated to McGill. A special library was built to house them. The Osler Library of the History of Medicine opened in 1929. In 1965, when the Faculty of Medicine moved into its current building, this library was dismantled and then rebuilt in exactly the same way in the new building and expanded. So you could see, this is it today. 
Now, there is a fire on the roof. Thankfully, the library itself wasn't damaged, but there was a fire on the roof of a couple of years ago. We had to empty out the library, had to move all now 110,000 items into rare books. The rare material went there. We had to clear off two kilometers of shelving to fit it all in there. The circulating collection went into the basement of the Red Path Library. And within five months of the fire, we were fully operational. And I just have to say this because it's a shout out to my colleagues and everyone else because it's a sign of our dedication, not only to the collection and preserving the collection, but then making it accessible. We really wanted to do this right, but then do it in a way so that people weren't deprived indefinitely of access to the book. Now, eventually they'll go back up in this space once all the surrounding work in the library is done, in the building, I should say. Um, but it's very exciting and it's a very rich collection. The focal point of this, again, I speak to my fellow bibliophiles about this, is what's called the Osler niche. Now, if you look there, it's that plaque on the wall. Behind that plaque, actually underneath the plaque, is the ashes of Sir William Osler, and then Lady Osler as well, and also Dr. Francis, the first librarian of the Osler Library. And the idea of being surrounded by your books in perpetuity is just wonderful, and I could completely understand why. Like I said, premier collection in the world. It's what Osler gave us is wonderful, and I'll show you some examples. This was the oldest thing in Osler's collection. It's a, a medical tablet, Assyrian as well, so from the um, Mesopotamian area, uh, 700 BC. It's ophthalmological, so it's it's a very interesting. Uh, look into medicine at the time. And those of you who suffer from any sort of eye ailments will be happy to hear this, that apparently the cure for them is, according to this, to get a serpent or a lizard. So, you know, you might want to look around and then to, to hold it. And then with to maybe your fingers or tongue to pull its tongue out. And then with the blood, you apply the blood to your eye, your injury, and that apparently will cure it and you'll be fine. So if any of you try it, let us know, you know, email us, tell us how you're doing. Um, uh, I was going to make a mean joke about, well, if you can't see after that, don't tell us because I don't want to know. Um, other thing, another wonderful book. This was perhaps or is perhaps the most important book in the history of medicine. It's a anatomical text from 1543 by a smart alecky Belgian uh, named Andre Vesalius who overturned 1500 years of understanding of the human body in this beautifully illustrated book that's about if you can see that big um, wonderfully detailed lifelike illustrations of anatomy and the same year interesting this book came out and Osler spent a very long time trying to get a copy of this. It's Copernicus's book on the solar system. Osler described this as a starred year because you have this great um, look at inside the human body. So a macro, a micro look at the universe and then a macro look at the universe with this. It's the only copy of the first edition in Canada. Osler at the time was desperate to get this because his collection also included the major works of science and he only saw it for sale twice in his collecting career so this is going back a hundred years no more than a hundred years and even then it was extremely difficult to get there was one at auction which he missed he was the underbidder at went for about 20 some odd pounds this he bought from a bookshop in cambridge for i think it's about 13 pounds and at the time, 13 pounds is equivalent in today's money of about $3,000 Canadian. Um, so affordable, like I'd like to say like a really cheap secondhand car price. Now, should you want to acquire a copy of this today, the only time I've seen these for sales in New York uh, by a dealer named Jonathan Hill, a wonderful uh, dealer in the history of medicine and science, Usually he's got them for sale. He's had them a couple of times for about two to two point five million dollars each. So from two thousand to two million, uh, it was a good investment. If any of you have two or three million dollars, you don't know what to do with, give me a call. Uh, we'll talk. 
we have other things that we've acquired subsequent to it. And one of them is uh, this copy, a handwritten copy of that famous poem, poem in Flanders Fields, because John McRae was a, a McGill man, not a medical graduate. He went to the University of Toronto. We don't hold that against him. Um, but he did study subsequently at McGill and was, was a pathologist here and involved here. And then in the First World War was involved with a field hospital in France that was organized by the faculty of medicine. So the dean of medicine became the CO, the commanding officer. The uh, medical doctors all came from the faculty at McGill. The nurses were all trained at uh, either the Montreal General Hospital or the Royal Victoria Hospital for the most part. And then the orderlies were all medical students. So they went on mass over there. Uh, McRae was head of medicine and he's, his background was not untypical for Victorian people because he was quite a jingoist. He believed in the British empire and the manly art of war. And after a few years though, in the first world war, this was written somewhat early in his career, but it starts to show the change where he starts to get disgusted in the war. And then by the end, by 1918, when he died of pneumonia, he was still in the field with the, the number three Canadian General Hospital. And people talked about his spirit. His energy was gone. His spirit was gone. He really, four years of seeing the butchery firsthand of what was going on was enough for him and others. So it's a very poignant poem, which I think brings home uh, for all of us, th that side of the war as well. So that's part of the collection at Miguel. And every November 11th of Remembrance Day, we often bring this out and we put it on display for people. We also collect other odds and sods and interesting things and artifacts, including glass eyes. You see them there. We have a lot of nice artifacts. Um, we take this out, unlike the poem for Remembrance Day, this often comes out on Halloween. And it's a salesman display kit of uh, um, prosthetic eyes. They're quite something. And it's kind of scary when you open the box and it, the box stares back at you, but it's wonderful stuff. And, indicative of it's just the interesting uh, variety of our collections. Another major uh, builder of the collection is this man, Casey Wood, who is an ophthalmologist, going from eyes to ophthalmology seems about right, who had a second career in ornithology. He grew fascinated with bird's eyes because of the superior vision of birds, and that led him to collecting. Now he's one of these people who is very intense, a lot of energy, and once he retired from ophthalmology, threw himself wholeheartedly into ornithology, became a, a, a knowledgeable writer on the field and a researcher, uh, but then also a great collector and founded what was the, the Wood Library of Ornithology uh, in 1920. And there's the book plate featuring the, the family parrot, uh, John III, which traveled with them everywhere and ended up on their book plate as well. He also managed to talk neighbors of his, he had retired to Pasadena to uh, found the Blacker Library of Natural History. So it was a combination of the two. And so quite a wonderful uh, collection, thanks to the two of them. Again, one of the superior ones in the world. You can see this is um, Casey Wood and his wife and his niece traveling in Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, to collect material there. So wonderful collection of uh, Indian and um, South Asian uh, material in the collection as well. Medicine, not just ornithology, but medicine in general, some other things as well. You can see that's just an example, one small example of the book bills to give you some idea of how aggressively and how consistently he collected and all the wonderful things he was able to find, including this, which is actually the subject of an international research project now. These are paintings that were done by the wife of a judge who was uh, sent from England uh, to take the bench in Madras, as was Chennai today. And in her spare time drew a one series of wonderful books, uh, wonderful paintings of the wildlife of India, mostly in the south, southwest, southeast of India, but I think other areas as well. And these were found it was an interesting story. You know, I, my time is not uh, 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 infinite, so I'll be somewhat quick with this. 
it's a wonderful story because it's very indicative of the length to which collectors will go to. And then if you work hard enough, how lucky you get. There's this saying in collecting, which is if you're trying to be exhaustive, the first 80% of anything you're trying to build up is relatively easy. It's getting that last 20% that's difficult. So in this case, Casey Wood would hoover stuff. He'd go everywhere, buy whatever he could, ship it off to McGill en masse. In this case, he was on a side street in London and he ended up in a small, uh, more like a, an art store than anything and asked, you know, oh, do you have any, you know, paintings of birds or anything like that? And um, apparently the owner sort of scratched his head and said, I think there might be something in the basement. So came up with, with a, a box with some of these wonderful paintings. And right away, the moment Casey Wood saw it, said, these are exceptional. This is not your everyday, you know, drawings of an amateur. These are exceptionally good illustrations. And then asked him if there were any others. And then was the, the owner didn't think so, but then there happened to be someone in the shop who said, said, oh, I think I was in here once before the war and you showed me this box that you had with all these other ones. So guy goes back downstairs, pulls up this teak chest, just filled with more of these done by Elizabeth Willem. And this wonderful collection, which he bought and has sent, came to McGill and has now been um, uh, a continued interest and as I said, now of interest, not only to people interested in historical material, but also contemporary scientists. Our natural history collection, which thanks in large part to Casey Wood, is one of the best in North America, if nothing else, is not only of antiquarian interest, it's also of interest to people who do contemporary science, like particularly environmental sciences, because you could study things like evolution of animals, their, their, um, their patterns of migration, as well as in the case you can study the landscape to see changes to things like shorelines and things like that to get sense of erosion. So it's wonderful in animating this collection as amongst others to be able to bring it to so many different directions, which at the time no one would have anticipated. Another interesting one, and I'll, I'll be very brief about this, is our feather book. And so this is a collection of illustrations made in Italy in the early um, 17th century using real feathers and other parts of birds. They're mostly interesting illustrations from, you know, uh, of the birds themselves or scenes from the Commedia dell'arte, that sort of thing. But what's also interesting about these is it might be some of the oldest genetic material available. So possibly this could be studied for its, you know, genetic influence, um, information about various species of birds as well. So again, lots of interesting things. Another major collector, Lawrence Landy, Montrealer, uh, early in the Canadiana game, I'd say, in the 50s and 60s, built a wonderful collection. And just before uh, Confederate, uh, Centennial of Confederation in 1965, so two years before, donated this wonderful collection of Canadiana to uh, the library. So this became the cornerstone of the Landy Canadiana collection, which is again another significant collection, in part because it was started before a lot of other people were collecting Canadiana. So he was able to collect a lot of very interesting things by working with a number of antiquarian dealers, including a man named Bernard Ampman, who was an early proponent of Canadiana. The funny thing being is he's Viennese, who came to Canada after the war, and who far more than most Canadians said, "You, this is an interesting history. We have a responsibility to collect it and keep it in Canada and worked very closely with Lawrence to, to make sure that happened. And McGill was the lucky recipient of that collection. It has a wonderful bibliography. It's quite beautiful. I'll just show you something right now. It's considered one of the most beautiful books produced. This is my copy. It's, as you can see, it's rich, beautiful paper, well printed. This copy I bought at an antiquarian book sale and used to belong to Jean Drapeau. So I was very excited to get that. I, my dad who loved Montreal, I was just sorry he wasn't alive to, to see that because it was really wonderful. Amongst the other gems he had is this, the first map of Montreal. You can see Donna Kona meeting Cartier down below here and the, the fortress that was Hochelaga, which we're not quite sure where it was. We have some ideas somewhere close to McGill. And this book, the first one printed in Montreal in 1776 
printed by Fleury Mesplan, a French printer who was in Philadelphia, who Benjamin Franklin came up, brought up to Montreal to print a propaganda rag, which became the Gazette to convince um, everyone that they should join the American Revolution. Didn't quite work, um, but he did produce the first book printed in Montreal, which is this. It's a um, confederacy of people to um, adore the Blessed Sacrament, so very much a Catholic um, tradition. What's interesting about this particular copy of the book, again, we go back to the idea of history, is it used to belong to the Archbishop of Montreal. It was in his library. And the reason it ended up with McGill via Lawrence Landy was because in the mid-1960s, the uh, bishop or someone in the Bishop Palace started throwing their library out and threw a bunch of books out to the Montreal dump. And then someone got the great ideas like, well, maybe instead of throwing all this stuff out all the time, why don't we offer it to someone? Uh, maybe we'll make some money. So they called up Bernard Atman. Atman bought it, sight unseen, bought a number of boxes uh, for I think about $1,000. All the boxes came to the store. He took out about a dozen that he thought were significant. The other ones he didn't like. Got a call a week later from someone else, very upset saying, oh, you ripped us off. Uh, you know, you only paid us a thousand dollars for like, I don't know, 200 boxes. Um, and he said, that's fine. You can have them all. All I want is this small number. So they then said, fine. So those boxes went back. God knows what happened to those. Uh, he kept these and sold them. So chances are this copy potentially could have ended up in the dump or who knows where, if not for uh, Lawrence Landy and Atman. Other collections, and this is one which people aren't so familiar with, um, is our Nathanson Lincoln collection, which surprises people why Lincoln and why Canada? Well, it's because Joseph Nathanson, who put this collection together, was trained at McGill in medicine again, um, ended up in the States and was helping his son on a history project with a history project on Lincoln and got interested. So he started building up this collection. And being a McGill graduate, he subsequently donated it to McGill. And it's got some wonderful things including this. I don't know if this name means anything to you. Um, I'm just... Doo -doo -doo. Oh, where is it? Yeah, Dr. Charles Taft. It's right in front of me. That's why I didn't know his name. Now, I'll give you a hint. It's Dr. Taft, and if you could read that, that'll tell you what it is. It's his diary of taking care of Lincoln from when the moment he was shot at Ford's Theater. So he describes it and he said, writes like I saw a man leap from the president's box shouting as he did so sick semper tyrannis Latin for thus always to tyrants and I thought oh my gosh you know Latin spouting assassins that's uh, Lynette squeaky from didn't I think shout that when she took a pot shot at Gerald Ford but I was impressed anyway so he describes that the other thing in the collection of course is the blood stain so supposedly just like the shroud here is the piece from the towel that was put under the head of the, of the president when he was shot. And it even has two different attestations of authenticity. So it must be true. Now, when we talk about rare books, people often think of things like maybe not Lincoln's bloodstained towel or a box of eyeballs. But you do think of you know, things like the Copernicus and this rare material, you know, diaries and that sort of stuff. But it's much more varied than that today. It's much broader. So we collect a number of different things, which you wouldn't necessarily think of as rare books in a sense. And I'll give you one example. When I was at the Oser Library, one of the things I bought and was very happy to have gotten a hold of was to document the AIDS epidemic in the 80s and 90s. I bought a comic book with low vocabulary but illustrations, and the idea was it was made for street people, junkies, to teach them not to share needles. So this was a way of out, doing outreach to a particular community in a way that was accessible to them. So things like that are special collections. They're not necessarily rare in the you know, Shakespeare first folio sense, but they're important ways of documenting our history, collective history. And I think that's where the ideas of social history come in. So we have a number of things that don't necessarily think of historically, like a children's collection and children's literature. 
again, talking about donors, we've been very fortunate in that there is a collector, is a collector named Sheila Bork, who had a wonderful eye for books. Now, children's books are a wonderful collection. The hard thing about collecting them is often they were owned by children. So they're in horrible shape. They're scribbled on, they're torn apart. My daughter ate her pop-up book once. So uh, I'll, I won't explain where it popped up eventually, or parts of it anyway. But we have this wonderful collection. Again, children's books are terrific, not only because they're often really interesting and interesting illustrations, they're also interesting to study what people thought was important to teach the children. So we have, and they're just, just a joy to work with. And in all these collections, we have great curators. Um, and this one is a woman named Ellis Hing who curates that. Lauren Williams curates the Natural History Collection and they do a great job and they just love collecting it. We have, again, this is another one of Ellis's areas, a cookery menu collection. Again, tells you a lot about diet, what people ate. Also of interest are to genealogists. And the reason for that is a lot of the cookbooks we collect are community ones and they'll have lists of names of, you know, the people of the a particular synagogue or, you know, um, the Arn Prior United Church 1957 and they'll give a list of names and that sort of stuff becomes quite interesting for people as well. So in a lot of different ways, very interesting. Of course, the graphics fascinating as well. Um, now we still are actively collecting material and this is again, part of the great joys of my life. So we, there, we collect a greater variety of material and we have a lot of different ways we can do it. Now you could see some of the, the curators. So that's Lauren there and she's this is in natural history. There's Ellis. And there's Mary Earle, who's the current Osler librarian. Um, and we're at the Montreal Antiquarian Book Fair a couple of years ago, collecting, because that's always very important. You never know what you've found. Here's a, an ugly fella who um, was uh, lucky to find a number of things from Jean Drapeau's library, a number of which I bought, including what you see there is the inquiry into the Olympic Games over cost overruns which Drapeau always said he'd write a book about because he was held responsible, he was mayor at the time, and never did. But it's an annotated uh, copy of the report, his annotation, so it becomes a very interesting thing to study uh, what, what he thought. We collect in a number of different means as well, through catalogs and online, of course, and people quote us things, people donate things to us, we've got some wonderful things that way. Um, but we do other things too, we digitize our collections. Boy, I'm grateful we, we did that especially now when we don't have access to our actual collections, we still have a lot of material that's online. It's, it's difficult and a complicated thing, but very much in the ethos of libraries, we then make them freely available to everyone in a number of different areas, including our website. We do a number of other things. We work with classes, we teach, we have students work with them. They're always surprised when you touch them. You said that's the whole point, part of understanding history and understanding the times is to see the artifacts, to feel the artifacts. So it, it reveals a lot of elements of the time which you wouldn't be obvious otherwise. We also have established a printing arts lab. Uh, that's one of our printing presses we just had restored. It coincidentally dates back from 1821, which is the same year that uh, the library was founded. It's, it's an extremely rare Colombian press. And when we re-inaugurated the, the press, uh, we staged this photograph. So we originally acquired it in the 50s or 40s. That's Cyril James, the principal, and that's Gerhard Lohmer, the, the, um, the head librarian. And of course, here's Madame Fortier, our current principal, and Dr. Colleen Cook, our current head of libraries, our Trent Home Dean of Libraries, in the reinauguration of the um, printing press a number of years later. We do other things that you wouldn't think rare libraries do. We had story time with the kids from the daycare to co coincide with one of our exhibitions on children's uh, books. That's my, my dear colleague, uh, Stephen Spodek, who uh, is reading to the kids. We have lectures and public uh, talks of various kinds. That is um, Alberto Manguel, who many of you will know, uh, the Argentinian Canadian writer and critique, uh, critic, and in this case, we had a number of lectures where he interviews people. And we have a number of videos of him talking about the library, which we're going to put online. I'll show you where you can find those in a sec. We have poetry, nature writing workshops, and 
poetry writing workshops and one of the other things we did that we did that with blue metropolis so there's lauren uh, talking about some of the collections that which was subsequently people there were writing about or inspired their writing we have a number of real exhibitions and virtual ones this is the one which was on and well until we close on the history of bridges in canada wonderful collection with a man named mark andrews who was uh, has a significant private collection so we collaborated on this now just so you know where to find things on our website we have a list if you google mcgill library and then go into the roar branch section you'll see what's going on but you also could watch recordings of past events so a number of them are available there and then you can just find out what's going on in the library in general by going to this page this is the home page and if i go now you could see that if i scroll over follow the library and then that'll give you links to hello can't do it that way number of ways so library matters that's our our newsletter there's our instagram accounts social networks on so the library in general rare in general the osler mcgill roar so we have a number of ways in which you can see what's going on instagram for one example extremely popular i think we have almost ten thousand followers uh, we have a great communications team librarians our communications officers work together um, and they just do a, a incredible job of putting out wonderfully interesting things um, and in so many different ways so you can keep up it's particularly now when of course we can't actually be here you could at least see what's going on now let me get back how do I get hello I've gone ahead and put the link to the uh, roar branch in the chat for everybody great well thank you very much for that no that's the thing i bought on ebay uh, okay just trying to figure out how i get back to my powerpoint well this is a good place as any to to leave anyway because it's this is a fun thing is just to leave you with the mcgill library homepage, and you can have a look at that and just explore it. go on the website and just have a good time looking at things there's just so much to learn we're always happy to hear from people uh, we're still accessible. If you go into the Rare Books or the Osler branch pages, you can certainly get a hold of us, or I'm sure my other colleagues in VAC as well. Um, there we are. And then you could just find out what's going on, and you can just email us. If you have questions or you're looking for things and you want to find out what's going on, that's fine. And remember, when we reopen, you're always welcome to come and visit and have a look at things. Now, I realize it's 7.59 so i apologize but i'm happy to stay if you have questions i won't take it personally if at this point you figured enough's enough and it's time to do some high priority drinking um heck why not i mean we are more than happy to our events you know do tend to often go until 8 30 or 9 so we're we're perfectly fine uh hosting you for a little bit longer and opening up the floor to questions um i'm going to change my view here to you're gonna cut me off that's good well i'm gonna oh, sorry were you were you no i'm done no i'm joking that was a joke <laughs> um i'm gonna take a look at let me see now i think i can see can i see all the people getting there um, okay, actually i'm going to do this Oh, and now I can see everybody. Hello. <laughs> so if you want to say something, please either put, uh, you can actually, you can ask your question, you can type it up in the chat, and I will go ahead and, and ask it out loud to Chris. Or if you want to ask a question yourself, I would recommend that you raise your hand. There is a hand raising thing at the bottom bar of the Zoom where you can have your, you know, your chat and your various other like start and stop mm -hmm. video things. There's a hand raising thing. Um, so please do raise your hand if you have a question and i will uh i'll keep an eye on who's got something to say <laughs> um do we have anybody with their hand up do we have anybody who wants to say anything oh, uh, was that Don? there's someone here dc don Derry has Sorry, a question that's don don Derry. yeah okay <laughs> Hi Don. Don Don Derry. Hi, yes. hi Chris. Hi. I know I've lost the visual. 
But I enjoyed the whole thing. I really did. And I Thank appreciate you. everything you said about McGill, about the library, about collecting rare books, about digitizing them. That's great. And I want to thank you for showing me Diderot's Encyclopedia many years ago, which I very much appreciate. <laughs> that was a great thrill. Thank you, Dot. It was fun uh, showing it to you. Uh, just for those of you who don't know, Dr. Don Derry was a professor of psychology for many years and uh, also a bibliophile who came to the Osler shortly after I started and I showed him around and yeah, you know, the Didio, the Diderot Encyclopedia from 1750 is beautiful. Uh, set came from Rock Robertson, who was former principal of McGill in the 60s and collected encyclopedias and atlases and had donated that to us. That's fascinating. Thank you. You're welcome. I actually have a question, if we oh, yes. get the raw ball. Before that, oh, though, because okay. this is a sort of demise yeah. for these sorts of events, I am going to stick that fundraising link in the chat one more time. Right, uh, and I see there is a question um, here uh, about um, if you have an interest in doing research in specific topics. Maybe that question went to you specifically. I'm yeah, it did. Okay. okay, and I'll and I'll answer this. So, in because it's true for anyone. You mind if reading you, the question out loud so that we can all know what the question okay. is? Okay, so it said if you want to research a particular topic, say illustrated rare books on birds or botany, what is the process like? of accessing these documents in the library. I've never been, uh, I've been, but never asked. Okay, the wonderful thing is uh, you can shoot us an email or give us a call or anything. Of course, now emailing would be the best thing to do to rarebooks.library.mcgill.ca. You'll see contacts on the, the page, on our homepage. And then we could meet with you or talk to you, depending on the situation. and get you um, get a better sense of what you're looking for and then find things that you might find interesting. Now, because of the situation, we can find online things that you might find interesting, but should anyone want to pursue a topic, uh, just easiest thing is to write us at our, our library email address and then we'll uh, figure out, you know, who's the best person is to take care of that. And we'll do that. And don't be shy, please. And there's no problem, of course, if you want to come and see things, either Usually it's easier to talk to us first so we have a better idea if you want, but we can always find things of interest to you in whatever subject you're doing. So thank you for that question. All right, so can we receive notice of library events? Yes, you can. Um, that was another question. There is a, um, uh, an email, you can sign up for notices for uh, events, library events and more events. And you'll see that on the events page. Let's see if I can go back. Let me see if I go to the Roar one. Just gonna see, cause normally we tell people events. Let's see if there's a link here. Um, so there is an email. So here are the exhibition event listings but you could just write us and then you could just, um, there's an email address. I'm just looking for it, passive e email. That's I think the general one, but you can, you can certainly follow that one too and just ask to be put on the mailing address and you will find out what's going on that way too. Are you putting that in the chat? Chris? Uh, yes, I can. At least the main link so that people can All right. click on the page. And... Over here to everyone. Do that now. That should be coming. I do see it, so there oh, we good. are. Okay, good. All right. We have, looks like we have three questions right now. Um, I'm okay. going to. I'm going to maybe do the raised hands first and then get back to the ones in the chat. So, um, Nick, Luca, yeah. had a question. Yeah. That's me. Thanks very much, Christopher. This has been excellent, fascinating. Um, yeah, lots you. of discoveries. And uh, I'm just donating some money to the Argo as well, just putting in a, a plug for that to encourage. Yay. Wonderful. 
Pat. But my question for you um, is, uh, what's uh, number one and number two on your wish list right now for acquisitions? Oh my gosh. Um, a new rare books library is number one. So if you've got, I, I think we're asking $15 million for naming rights for the, the new rare books library. Well, as an architecture <laughs> professor, I can appreciate and endorse that. Yes. <laughs> so, so what's number two then? You know, it's really hard to say. That's almost like asking someone who their favorite child is because we've got such a, a, an outstanding collection of different kinds of material that it's, it's hard to say, you know, oh, I'd give my right arm for X. But I will share something with you. And this is, this is more um, mea culpa. One of the things I felt was a shortcoming when I was at the OSER that I tried to do, but I think wasn't as successful as I wanted to be, was collecting material about the AIDS epidemic. I mentioned one thing to you, but I thought, you know, that was such a significant thing. And just like, of course, our current COVID-19 is, you know, a, a significant uh, public health crisis that I probably didn't do it soon enough or hard enough to get a lot of the ephemeral material, which subsequently, um, you know, probably once it was no longer readily obvious and useful, got thrown out. So that's the sort of stuff I wish I'd collected more of in but I put the call out for for that sort of stuff. For the, if I if I could, I'm not head of the OSER anymore. But that was the sort of thing I would have loved to collect. So there Keep we go. Thanks. So 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 from one extreme yeah. to the other. Yeah, well that's excellent. Keep thank it up. For, okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for your question and thanks for supporting the Argo. Next question. We did have another question, but the person who had raised their hand seems to no longer be in the room. So maybe they'll come back. In the meantime, we oh, had, I'll Brandif? go, I'll go into the chat. Is, is that Brandif? It was Brandif. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I saw, yeah, I saw that Brandif has raised their hand. Okay. So we'll go to the, so we'll go into the chat. Um, okay. There's a question here. Uh, let me find it. Thanks, Chris. I loved how you brought the act of building these collections to life with so many anecdotes. Do we have personal diaries of many of these major collectors and or correspondences? Yes, we do in some cases. Um, Osler, we do have a, a substantial uh, number of letters and related things, archival holdings for him. The um, Casey Wood as well, he uh, was the sort of person who would sometimes write several letters a day to say Gerhard Lomer or other people and we have them all you know i pity anyone who's a 21st century historian because up until the 1990s of course most things were on paper and there was not only the fact that the paper itself has been kept in many cases but that they were also well organized so the archives of the mcgill library from that period are quite good so for casey wood there are files like sometimes like six months of correspondence will be like this thick like three or four inches and so it's easy in his case and I wrote a, a chapter in an upcoming book that Miguel Queens is publishing on uh, on Casey Wood and his collection and uh, it was it was like a richness of material I got to know him probably more than I wanted to quite frankly um, to uh, uh, get a sense of who he was because of that so there are Lawrence Landy is another one who's who's well documented um, so there are, there are, there's some information. And interesting, Osler has been well written about, Casey Wood is something, but a lot of these stories are untold. So if anyone's interested in, in that kind of history, as I am in library history, uh, there's, there's material out there. Next question. Thank you. We have another question in the chat. Hi, Chris. Thanks for the talk. This was incredibly interesting. I agree. Uh, do you know whether McGill's libraries have any collections of interest in music history, historical scores and manuscripts and the like? Anything of note you'd like to mention offhand? Yes, um, there, there is a very good um, collection of historical material of that sort, archival and um, recordings and scores and related at the music library itself they're they're wonderful it's a it's a, an amazing library in many different ways and i'm not as familiar with their collection as i'd like to be so um i would encourage you to um 
to go and visit them. I do know that they do have a number of recordings, LPs, 78s, and related ones, some of which have been digitized. So one of the links, which I should have shown you and I didn't, but I'll tell you about is uh, to our digitized collections. You can find them on the homepage, and I believe there is um, some of the music holdings are there as well. So including early recordings. So they're definitely worth following up in, in early sheet music as well. And I'm on the library other, website right now. Would that be the Digital Scholarship Hub? Is that what you're referring to? Uh, can you see my screen? Um, I cannot. You can oh. share it again if you would like. Okay. You can share it again if you want to. All right. Okay. Um, let me see if I can. Or if you can tell me where to find that, I can probably grab the link. Yeah, it's actually, it's on the home page. Bill Library's home page? Yeah, yeah, because I'm, I'm here now. Let's see if I can share. Okay, share screen, here we are. Uh, is it showing up? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I am, there we go, okay. All right. Okay, okay. we're on so, the, we're seeing it, the McGill Library okay. homepage. Good, so we go to the McGill Library. So you just have to Google McGill Library and you'll find it. So find information as you can see there, accessing online resources, so find information, subject ID. Oh, by the way, I should just be pointing this out to you because it's very interesting. Um, there are a number of uh, different kinds of information that are available um, and some of it is available to the public, some of it's available uh, to people who are McGill alums. By the way, as a McGill alum, you get a free library card and if you come in, even if you're not, if you have no affiliation with McGill, you can always come in and use this when we're open, of course, because we have a lot of different kinds of information that's available to you as well. So it's a lot of fun to explore these various sorts of information. And then it's that government scholarship. I usually just Google stuff. So digital exhibitions and collections are right here. So I went find information then at the bottom. And okay, so now it's going back and forth. Sorry, did this thing pop up? You probably saw that. I'm sorry about that. There we go. Oh, and look, Habitat, because we have um, a number of archival, great archival collections, Canadian archival collection, CAC, and including uh, Moisha Safdie's archives. So here we go in alphabetical order. You see that as well. And I don't know if that'll work over here, digital exhibitions as well. And it'll give you a sense of just this great variety of material we have on number of different subjects. That's a Wilder Penfield, who was one of the pioneers in neurosurgery, founder of the Montreal Neurological Institute. We have, a, again, a massive archival collection of his stuff. Some of it has been digitized. There's a lot more to be done there. So digital exhibitions, digital collections. So there we go. This is just, if you have time on your hand, you want to you wanna do some virtual traveling, uh, this is a fun site to play on just to look up things in general. Fantastic. And then we have, as you can see, the internet library. We have um, digitized books, so 17,000 things from our collection. Most of them, those are things that are out of copyright, so you can, you can look at, including, and then we have other things like McGill yearbooks, old McGill. So you can go and look up your, your grandparents or other people, yearbook as well. Okay. Uh on, on a similar topic about McGill, McGill history, we did have another mm -hmm. question in the chat as well. Yes. Um, asking if there is a collection about the architecture of McGill buildings. Ah, yes, yes. Um, there's a number of different things because that's the sort of information that's collected in different areas. So we have things like specific architects, archival phone or collections like Percy Nobbs who designed a number of buildings at McGill, including the extension to the Red Path Library from 1922, what is now the McCord Museum, which was a student union building and others. So that has wonderful information and drawings there. Of course, the university itself has kept those. So they have 
drawings and blueprints and related information about buildings at McGill. There is a site, a website of buildings and their history, which is being revamped. My colleagues are working on that. I don't know if that's been launched yet. But there's an older one where you can find information about the different buildings as well. So that's the sort of information that's uh, this is not uncommon in archival research where things are in different areas, but pulling them together gives you a very rich overview of a number of things. And if you are, if that's an area that interests you, please write us and we can certainly uh, provide you with both online uh, information and references to other material as well. Fantastic, thank you. Sure. Um, if you have asked another question in the chat and I have not spoken it out loud yet, that means that I missed it. So please post it again. Um, otherwise, if anybody has a hand they want to raise, any other questions? Um, my question was extremely, uh, extremely basic, which was uh, just wondering how much of these collections are on display. Like if I was just to wander into the library, what, what would I be seeing at any given moment? Okay, there are, there are different uh, places where things get displayed. I, I, I should say our visual arts collection is everywhere on the university, both outside and indoors. So that part of our collection is the most um, diffused. That's the point of it is to provide public art uh, to people. And so when you're on campus and you see what's called the three bears, the fountain with the three women, uh, that's part of the art collection or in the various buildings or in offices where you see paintings and sculpture as well. The material in say Osler, when Osler goes back to McIntyre, there's an exhibition area there and a couple of other ones. So you will see the display cases there. In the McLennan Library building in the uh, lobby, the ground floor lobby, there are three display cases. That's where the bridge exhibition is currently. And if you come up to the fourth floor, there is first uh, in the landing an exhibition area then there's a visible storage gallery which it's a beautiful little space so you come up you see interesting things that change every month or so in the lobby and then you have the paintings in what is the hallway going to the reading room and there are chairs so you can go and just spend some time just relaxing and chilling and seeing paintings and just transposing yourself and then if you come into the reading room, there's more display cases. Uh, and there are, there are eight, 10 of them, say. And again, those get changed up fairly frequently. And then there's the big printing press. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole, I won't say Via Della Rosso, but uh, um, a Via Biblioteca uh, to, to be enjoyed and, and art as well. Fantastic. Um, I am not seeing any more questions from the chat. If there's something you've that's been burning, you go, you wanted to ask it. This is your chance. Or email us, or write us, or phone us. Anything. We're always happy to hear from people. I've gotten two more questions when I said that in the chat, which is great. Yes. Um, <laughs> question number one: Is there any material about comics, graphic novels, or graphic storytelling? Ah. That's a very good question. Uh, that might be better dis, um, represented in the um, contemporary, in the uh, McLennan Library building or in the Blackadder Lauderman Art and Architecture Library. So those could be particularly more recent examples of that work and maybe scholarship on it. We do have more historical collections of caricatures. Um, so going back to the, the predecessor, predecessors, so Napoleonic ones, the, um, the Osler Library has um, medically related uh, epinal. Those are sort of like the origins of comic strips. Those were done on usually newsprint in sort of the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, there are some in the Rare Books collection as well. And those are usually multi-panel uh, comics as well. So again, different sorts of things in different parts of the collection. And I should say that McGill Collection being as rich as it is and as old as it is, even in the circulating collection, you do find older material. And of course, you know, you're talking the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years, a lot of other material as well. Um, okay, 
you're getting, yeah, the, the questions are coming in now. Oh. Um, one, uh, might need a refill. <laughs> let's see. Um, so there's a question is, is there, a, what is, uh, the, the thing that you most would have wanted to introduce to us that you've left out of the presentation so far? Uh, my cats. <laughs> They're around here somewhere. They're big and fluffy and, um, I'm sure we would all be yeah. delighted okay. if they had okay. a cameo appearance. Yeah. Okay. So th there are so many. Gosh, where to begin? Um, we have a great Expo collection. Okay. So Expo 67. And, and what's wonderful about it is it's a really um, heterogeneous collection. So this is one of the examples I like to bring up when you said, like, there's really interesting and weird things in our collection. So Expo was such a pivotal moment in Montreal history in particular, but Canadian history in general. So there's all kinds of interesting things in that collection. You know, there were the pamphlets that the various pavilions put up, put out, uh, books that were put out about it, guides, et cetera, et cetera. But then also a lot of tchotchkes or like ashtrays, which we have. And I think the one of the things I find which is quite fun is um, we purchased fairly recently a model of the Air Canada Pavilion. So it's a maquette, which we bought from an antique dealer here in Montreal which is quite wonderful. There were two of them made apparently, and, and this one came out of the house of an Air Canada executive. Uh, so that was one example. The other example, so going to extreme, is a little bar of soap, Expo 67 soap, like the, you know, the motel kind of soap as well. So just the collection itself, I find quite wonderful there. And I, and, and I love looking through it. And again, because it's so evocative of a very particular time, I think a rather optimistic time and, and something as a Montrealer I think we, we all felt very proud about um, that it's a it's a joy to to look through it. Yeah I've certainly spent some time thinking about so the Argo just recently celebrated 50 years in its current location. Mm -hmm. We were across the street for a couple of years from 66 to 69 and then there was a fire and then we moved I say we I mean I <laughs> board then but you know <laughs> we, we as an institution um mm -hmm. moved to um to the i guess north side of st catherine and have been there since 1969 um and in preparing the the 50 year celebration that we had last summer um or this yeah this past summer i did a bunch of digging on the history of the store and kind of put together a timeline of the argo and that included thing i mean the the store's been around since 1966 so it i did a lot of thinking about expo and about what it would have been like to be opening a brand new bookstore yeah. with expo on the horizon and what kind of atmosphere that must have been like well um i was born in 66 so i can only really tell you uh i was one at expo so but montreal in the 60s i think there was a real sense it's 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 almost like a dichotomy because on the one hand it was a very optimistic time in general montreal was really developing if you think the opening of the metro the development of downtown and all the new buildings in the 60s like possible marie uh, square victoria and um the sense that montreal was the, not only the economic center of canada but the cultural center of canada so it was quite a wonderful time of course flip side is particularly as you get later into the 60s a lot of the fissures which in within society started appearing, the FLQ um, and the October crisis being the sort of the most dramatic example of it, but also if you think of things like the Sir George Williams riots um, by students of color feeling discriminated against, you know, issues like that came up as well, um, issues around poverty too. But yes, very fascinating time. So another question from the chat, uh, yes. where is your dentistry collection and your biology collection? Ah, okay. So dentistry is is an interesting one. There is material in the Osler Library of the History of Medicine because medicine is defined writ large. So there are historical works in dentistry. It's not a, a huge area. Things from the 19th and 20th century, the, um, the various collections in the, the medical library uh, certainly document dentistry as well. So th that would be another area. So technically the Schulich Library of the STEM, you know, sciences and medicine would, in engineering, would have some of that material as well. Biology, again, depending on what you're looking at, could be in different places. Some of the biological sciences, of course, were in 
Blacker Wood, so the historical collection now being with us in rare books, but also the also Library of the History of Medicine, and again in the you know, current sciences library, because in particular, if you think of journal literature in the 19th and 20th century, which is still held um, outside rare books, uh, you know, the, 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 the inventions, the discoveries in the journal literature, which was so important then, is so well documented in our collections. Uh, if you think of nature, you know, 1953 with the discovery of DNA and all of those things that you can think of, all those great, you know, discoveries in the 20th century, late 19th would all be in that journal literature. Mm. Oh. That is all the questions I'm seeing. Any any stragglers wanting to chime in with anything? If not, uh, were there any you know further comments or, or closing words or anything else you'd like to say, Chris, before we uh, before we wrap up here? There's a cat. There it is. Ah, yay. yay! Okay. Oh, it's James, King James. Oh my gosh. Oh, <laughs> King Herod might be a better description. A phenomenal cat. Phenomenal indeed. Yes, so um, I just want to reiterate. Please. Oh, oh and here's Selena. Here's the other one. So they're brother and sister. They're both huge. They're McGill alumni. They are McGill alumni, actually. And <laughs> we adopted them when one of my colleagues sadly died. Um, but um, I think he died trying to pick them up. Um, <laughs> so, yes, please uh, think of us as, as a cultural institution in the city, much like Argo. You know, we're, um, I'd like to think we're, we're some of the things that make this city a nice place to, to live. And it's as much has to do with our attitudes as it does with our collection. Right. Buy a well, book. What? Buy a book. Buy a book. <laughs> Buy several. Uh, well, thank you so much you. Uh, for, for being here with us tonight, Chris. This has been a, a beautiful lecture and uh, we've learned so thank much. You. Um, there's been so many comments in the in the chat. A lot of people have been incredibly uh, appreciative of of, uh, of your your time and your knowledge and uh, and of us for for hosting this. So uh, well, I want to thank everybody who took some time out of their yes. evening to thank come you. here and be a part of this. Um, obviously, yeah. we our, our community is is both for libraries and bookstores is such a huge part of what what makes us exist and what makes us be special places that. You know that we can share the love of, of books and stories and communication um and when and when we are able to get together the first rounds on me <laughs> all right thanks so much um as i have mentioned in the past uh if you go to our website argobookshop.ca um you can not only see our entire catalog where you can order stuff um and that includes all, any type of things we can order from elsewhere and what we have in store um but also all our events are on there there's a mailing list there's just all kinds of stuff. We are we are around and we are staying active and we're here for you. So uh, thank just you, Adele. Because that's what I need to do. Here it is. Oops, I just sent it only to Moti. I'm gonna send it to everybody one last time. That donations link. Um, and I'm going to wish you all a beautiful evening. And uh, drop in next week for the book club with uh, with uh, Chi Ying Lai. So thank you so much. Good night, Goodbye. everyone. Goodbye. Bye.